John, uh, waiting for you to unmute. Welcome back to face. It's great to be here. Can you hear me? Got you, yeah. John. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Awesome. Great bean call last time, John. I mean, uh, <laughs> on your way out, you said buy beans and, uh, they, they were really a moonshot, um, you know, led, uh, all commodity markets, uh, as far as performance on the, uh, on the upside. So very nice call. If it starts with, thank you. If it starts with a B, um, buy it, I guess, Bitcoin and beans, you know, oh, you okay. I, I didn't think about that. So are you going to be sharing your screen today? No, unfortunately, I got some tech issues, so I'm just talking on my phone. Um, oh, okay. And, uh, I, that's right, why I, was that's I spent 15 minutes trying to get my laptop to work, and it just didn't. So, all right. Well, maybe yeah. maybe I'll take us around the horn, John. And sure. uh, John, you know, I was curious. Uh, I wanted to know what was your uh, reaction when uh, Jack Schwager reached out to you and said he wanted to put you in his book, Unknown Market Wizards. A tremendous sense of honor and, 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 and humbleness. Um, you know, obviously, Jack's an iconic author. Um, yeah. And in our industry, and, and, and to be even considered um, with that pantheon of great money managers and traders, um, just a consideration and a thought is um, honestly like kind of bigger than me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's too much. Yeah. It's, it's kind not, of intense. It, yeah. So, yeah, you know, because you probably read all his previous books and then sure. all of a sudden he's writing about you. So uh, what was really your breakthrough? I, I know in the book it talks about you really becoming more of a, uh, a system type trader where you kind of uh, automated your ideas. Was that the big breakthrough for you? I think we should we should qualify that, um, Dale, just briefly. So I'm a person that trades very discretionary, but on top of like a form, on top of a, a systemic, pro an automated process, if you will, I, and that sounds probably a little jumbled, but here's what I mean by that. Um, I go about my business and have a process in place, but there's still this very much discretionary aspect or I allow myself some of that discretionary leeway. I think the breakthrough was establishing processes around a narrative to complement the technical analysis that I use. So I'm- okay. Well, like I appreciate, you know, purely automated trading strategies and they have their role, but what I tried to like articulate in market wizards was that in, in really much in much more expansively in the global macro edge, the book I wrote like five years okay. ago, it, it took five years to write is it, is it, it's about leveraging those strategies and gearing up and gearing down based on the regime that we're in. Okay. So if we're okay. in a regime that's conducive to a certain type of trading strategy, um, then you want to leverage up those or, or, or gear up the exposure to that strategy. Conversely, or correspondingly, if we're in a, you know, a regime that's not so conducive, then you want to like lever down those strategies. Okay. And so naturally, I mean, if you're, if, 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 if you just run every strategy at a one X, okay. Or one X leverage, right. You know, all the time, well, you're going to go through regimes where it's, you know, they'll, they'll work out, they won't work out. And like, okay, here's sort of like, I'm going to try and benefit from, certain diversification properties. But if I like understand that right now, like let's go back to the bean call, that we're in a reflationary market environment. And now I'm looking like to, to play momentum strategies. Okay. So let me analyze what, you know, what aspects of this regime, i.e., you know, ex expanding gamma, okay. Market repricing, um, inflation expectations that are out there um, or increasing accelerating inflation expectations or, or factually accelerating just inflation in and of itself. Um, now what I want to do with a beam strategy. Okay. Now what I want to do with, 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 with or now what I want to do with a breakout in certain commodities, like let's take oil, for example, let's take, you know, Bitcoin, for example. All right. If you understand the macro narrative and you gear your strategies around that regime or that macro narrative okay you can take and this is the main point i kind of try to convey you okay. can take what are very cool opportunities and leverage them up so instead of being one even one and a half x or two x um and then you throw an optionality and trade structure around that you create some big you know, some really nice things and, and all of this sort of descended from kind of a bottom-up approach where like as, as weird as it sounds like i used to be very like um just trade economic trader. I talk about in the chapter about how I built this proprietary trading software, you know, called impact. And it effectively, you know, can, can read and process things in, in sub millisecond time. And I'll spend days building contingency models of, of how I'm going to execute based on certain scenario outcomes. Right. And so okay. that is what you look at is effectively like kind of like a bottom up approach. And I think that's to your point about automating things. Right. 
Like, because yeah. I have this automated outcome based on this one event, but the process of getting understanding that those outcomes is a, is a byproduct of sort of everything I had just covered in the last, you know, three or four minutes here. Okay. Uh, what's the definition of protein? Sure. No, protein um, comes from, well, let me give you the definition, then I'll give is a little, it little Greek? history. Greek derivative? Is, is it, it's a Greek derivative, absolutely. So it means um, so, highly versatile, so, easily adaptable, and able to take on many shapes and forms. Okay. Interesting. All right. Yeah. So I, I knew it probably had a Greek uh, root or derivative because- Well, it, well uh, it's almost... from the Greek god Proteus. So Poseidon- oh, okay. Yeah. Poseidon what, what was the um, obvious the god of the god of the water, god of the sea, and his right. son Proteus, obviously- um, took on the, that same shape, that same water-like form. And, and for those here in the States who have seen the ESPN 30 for 30 um, about Bruce Lee, you know what I mean? I think it's called Be Water, okay? Right. And for right. All, the prop, all the malleable properties water has. And I came across this word back in 2012. I'd never heard of it before. I didn't know what it meant. You know what I mean? I'm in my late 30s. Yeah. I'm like, I see a word. I don't <laughs> even know what this thing means. Yeah. I'm like, protean? Like, what does protean mean? And I read it and I'm like, highly versatile easily adaptable able to take on many shapes and forms how would i not know what this is like the coolest word ever i love this yeah word, you know and uh I, I, yeah i uh hope someday to be protean instead I'm, of I'm, cement I'm, I'm, i want to be you, water so you me both sir you me both sir trust me so uh do you see you know uh there's a lot of talk right now john about yields you know i was talking about them back in august i, I thought the most crowded trade uh, you know, especially after the COVID crash was in the bond market and uh, it's interesting treasuries um, are almost back to the level that they were here. I'll put up the TLT where they were when the Fed came in and, you know, that old expression, don't fight the Fed. Um, I guess there's a caveat except in the treasury market. See, we're almost right back to this level. This was uh, when the Fed came in, whereas uh, things like corporate bonds and junk right. um, are just starting to roll over. Uh, can uh, you have any explanation for why treasuries, which are supposed to be the quality, right? The flight to right. quality, why right. uh, they're under more pressure than junk bonds uh, made new highs, I believe, last week. And corporates are finally looking like they might be rolling mm -hmm. over. What's your take here on um, global and uh, U.S. debt markets? Sure. So let's just take a step back. <clears throat> um, great question. Great, great relative comparison between those two asset class, those two subcomponents of an asset class. Um, let's keep in mind, like, what's, what is a factor when driving credit quality or the movement in price and credit quality? And that is sort of solvency risk, right? And so let's think okay. about what, what's at play here, right? Do you think that the idea of, and we can even take a look at the Russell 2000, the idea of a U.S. recovery, a blistering U.S. recovery does what for perspective broad, just broad based, speaking generally, Dale, like does what yeah. for perspective credit quality, okay? Is it a good thing? If I'm going to underwrite loans, that the, the economy is starting to expand, and these businesses are potentially going to make more money. Or is that a bad thing for credit credit quality? Right. It's it's a good recovery. Thing for it's good. Yeah. Okay. It's a great thing. Right. Now right. let's also sort of like juxtapose that on on um, on like the fact that the Fed and the Treasury are now kind of working hand in hand, and that you could end up getting you know the vaccination rate of the United States is accelerating. Okay. It is it is doing. We we are going to have. I, I, listen, I, I'm not a virologist, an epidemiologist, but, but I'll say this, that, that we seem to be on a pace, okay? And the people that I respect and read that we're going to have like by this summer, not like where none of us are gonna be wearing masks again, but the, 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 the vaccination around the United States is a reason why or the success of it or the prospective success of it um, does lend itself to some, some commodity um, inflation, which we're seeing in soybeans, right. which we're seeing in oil, which we're seeing... Well, also, let's take a Copper. factor here. Like, do, do you think a, a tough supply chain? Because I think the bigger, the, the bigger challenge for like, um, and, and why, why why we saw inflation numbers in the PPI yesterday is, is the bottleneck in the supply chain. Okay, is that we have the Fed that has explicitly said we're going to let this economy run hot. Okay, I mean, and I can see the Fed coming out talking about, oh, this inflation is transitory. But you're going to see, you're going to hear more and more um, conversation about supply chain issues impacting inflation. And when you're right. looking at like what what crude oil is doing, what soybeans are doing, okay, and the fact that Bitcoin is actually doing what gold is supposed to be doing, okay, you're looking at the gold silver ratio right now, and you're 65, 
which is down from 80. You know, it was, I mean, the gold silver ratio was at 80 back in like late November. It's now down at 65. For that kind of a ratio to have that big of a dramatic movement on it, okay, is, is another sign as well. And so kind of, I guess, going back to sort of Jack Swagger's, you know, your question about the Jack Swagger breakthrough moment, it's understanding these qualitative discretionary narratives and then overlaying them on top of like a technical trading process and being able to say, okay, why is this happening? And so like, to your point, you asked the great question, why is it the corporate credit is not coming off as much as, you know, sort of like legacy AAA yeah. rated government debt. And, yeah. and so I think if we just can deconstruct that sort of like we have, you end up with an answer that satiates that and think, okay, well, let's also keep in mind another factor of like global yields. And that is like, what are Boone's, what are Boone's doing in Germany? What are Gilt's doing in the UK? And those ideas, like, well, global fixed income is selling off in general. So it's not just necessarily the sell off in, in U.S. fixed income is just about the, you know, um, investment grade debt versus, you know, corporate debt. But you're, you're talking about what, what are global yields doing, you know, and, and those are also coming under pressure. And so there's not like the sort of relative value trade to come in, which is why I think, man, I hate saying this. Or I don't hate saying this is what it is, but I think gold can be like at 1720, 1730, um, because real yields are going higher. OK, and, 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 and I, I don't think that like people have fully appreciated yet that we can get a legit uptick in inflation and then you can see the Fed come out and say, yeah, but we're not going to do anything about it. I mean, what's going to happen to 30 year treasuries? And the Fed says, listen, um, we're not going to be raising rates in the next, you know, whatever, blah, blah, blah. I mean, even if the U.S. stimulus doesn't end up being, you know, one point nine trillion, even at one point four, like you have a blistering economy. You have back. I mean, the economy is basically two shots in the arm from like really just kind of not being back to full normal, but like, man, like there's a lot of, there's a lot of gasoline. <laughs> there's a lot of gasoline out yeah. there that can just get lit up. Um, you know, so there you go. So what do you think? Uh, you know, there was, uh, you know, I'm not comparing this to 1987, but you have to say there's uh, some disintermediation between um, equities, uh, you know, your major indices and what's happened with yields. Uh, they, you know, from the bottom in April in, in equities, um, rates have tripled on the 10 year. And uh, don't you think that's going to play a role and possibly uh, change the regime in S&Ps? Are you starting to get some signs that this market, especially with what's happening with uh, a lot of blow off uh, type uh, windfall moves across the board, not just crypto, but marijuana stocks, almost everything you're seeing five baggers, uh, penny stock volume off the charts. Um, do you think that the market's in a precarious situation up here right now? And is it viable for just maybe a 10 to 20% correction with what's going on here? Or am I premature like I've been for a while? Yeah. So I, I would say my sentiment on that is one of like, and this probably goes to like my personal life. I've, I've had a life sort of advisor performance shaman, if you call them. I've yeah. gone to therapy, you know what I mean, for the last 20 years. And what I've really focused on um, is, is kind of like justifiably or, or, or attempt to balance sort of the past, the present, and the future. But really with the focus on kind of being present in this moment. And being okay. present about what we're what we're doing right now, and sort of having the faith and confidence that that I've put in place a process that that when a more protracted sell off emerges, then my twenty five plus years of market experience is going to like give me the data and the indications that that moment will happen, and and it's not it's not everything you're saying is credible as as precursors to what a market sell off can look like, but but in this moment, okay. The amount of flows that are there, it really comes down to what is your risk management process? Because that kind of question you're asking now is, is really, I think, something that like if you're a buy and hold investor and you don't have a credible risk management process in place, then, then that to me is more concerning. If you have a credible risk management process in place, which is, again, the global macro edge, I talked about this, you know, maximizing return per unit of risk. If you're going to look at something you better know what your unit of risk actually is. Am I risking, is my unit of risk 2% of a portfolio? Is it 10% of a portfolio? What unit of risk will I allocate in terms of to a certain strategy to a manager, all right? And so those factors you mentioned can persist and, and, and I could probably push back and say, not that I like, that this is my, my thesis, but you know we've never before had this sort of unprecedented 
level of um, you know cooperation between the Fed and the Treasury right now. I mean, we have True. a former Fed chief running the Treasury, okay? And if you right. put a gun to my head and said, all right, what are like, if you could only take, you know, sort of like, um, if you could only take like three things with you that you'd want to have, all right, what would you want to do to like to, to effectively define a bull market? I'd want negative real yields. Well, check. I'd want the Fed and the Treasury, in, you know, working towards, I, I want fiscal stimulus on my side. I want monetary policy on my side. And I want like an expanding economy and growth multiples. And, 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 and all those things are present here. Okay. So like, I'd ask, you know, I'd say like, if you're not going to buy equities, okay, definitely there's without a doubt, both qualitatively and I think empirically, some real froth out there and you're referencing that quite viably, yeah. but, yeah. but, but, but correspondingly, the other variables there, like, do you really want to like be in a, do you really want to not be exposed to a market if you're a money manager, just take, take, to put your like $2 yeah. billion money manager hat on. Do you not yeah. want to be exposed to the market with, 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 with U.S. vaccines increasing exponentially week over week? Do you really are you going to tell your investors when we're at 42 on the S&P that you can't be that you weren't exposed as like the Fed and Treasury are working together? Are you you're really going fired. To invest, you're fired, dude. You're effing yeah. fired. OK, yeah. like you're done. All right. You, it's defensible to lose money with all the with, with the aforementioned metrics I just went over. It's not defensible to not make money, especially if you're real money, passive flow kind of guy with those metrics out there. It's just you're done. OK, so there's too okay. much career legacy risk with those underlying dynamics. You can't tell your investors, well, I thought it was a little too frothy because of GameStop. You know what I mean? Or I thought it was, <laughs> you know, I thought with, I thought with yeah. Bitcoin at 52,000 that, that I couldn't own the S&P 500. You know what I mean? It, it, so yeah. I, I think it's more about what sectors do you own in that case. It's I about retention. It's about retention, yeah. keeping your Completely. clients, Completely. right? Completely. Uh, you know, uh, we have a question here from. Uh, one of our attendees, and I don't know how you feel about it, but I've always believed that the dollar and the foreign exchange market, uh, especially the dollar being the reserve currency, is kind of like the fulcrum of the wheel that all other asset classes spin around. Um, is the dollar going to continue to be the uh, sacrificial lamb? Because, I mean, you could get appreciation in markets because of supply chain, but you could also get nominal gains from a continuing weakening dollar. Uh, you have a view on the dollar? Um, it's not as, I do. It, it's probably not as, um, not as everyone's uh, bearish more, so uh, it, i mean it's, could, no, it, it's not as self-aggrandizing as, as, as about the, the, the dollar is the dollar is this end-all be-all or the fx markets are end-all be-all I, I used to sort of carry that view really about rate different yeah because here's the deal though but like rate differentials now are non-existent in, in, in the short term between right. like, look at the euro look at the us look at yen everyone's at zero Great so, so if, you're gonna, if you're gonna make the currency argument that like that, that, that fx is where it starts i'm like eh in, in so far as it like with rate differentials on short term yields, you know, basically like at negative 50 bips or negative 25 bips or zero, like it's it's really tough to like that argument. It's a little softer now as it was 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. I do think that the fulcrum now, though, um, is central it's a little more blended. It, it, it's a little more blended, I'll just say. OK, okay. Um, mm -hmm. across across equities. And I think that if you want to like look now at like, OK. I mean, the S and P is the king, and the, you know the Russell two thousand doing what it is, and now you're seeing like equity markets and fixed income markets of those, like the real reflections of like which country is 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 ahead of the game. And I do think last time we briefly touched on this that like that what we're going to see in the next six months would be like whose supply chains were the most adept, who was the most adept at rolling out vaccines, sort of similar to like a wartime analogy. All right. And okay. so I want to get to that question, that user's, um, that, that, that attendee's question of about, you know, is the dollar going to be second for land? But I think that we first need to understand the prism from which we are evaluating this market right now. And I think that prism is commodity reflation, i.e. the price of oil headed higher. So that's going to put pressure on the dollar, obviously. OK, um, we're going to look at, you know, other commodities doing well, domestic growth reflected in like the Russell 2000, I think, you know, um, and, and, and we're looking at tech. Looking at inflation accelerating, okay, those are all things that, um, that that with the Federal Reserve not going to act. If you have like inflation accelerating in the U.S. and the Fed basically not raising rates, that is also you know deleterious to, to the dollar as well. So I think that that that, that for factors maybe different than what than what that per, than what the question asked. Yes, the dollar could go down, but I'm more 
But if the dollar goes from 121, your USD is at 121, and, and in six months it's at 124, yawn. Like that's kind of a yawn situation for me. Like I just don't. Okay. What, like yeah. Like there's just there's just other trades out there, and FX has been kind of a wasteland. And so they got like, it has. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I don't, I, you know, uh, even though it's our bailiwick, uh, all the action's been elsewhere. It's yeah, all so been that, in equities, okay. crypto, yeah. Yeah. Um, marijuana stocks, everywhere right. else but currencies. Right. So, so the central so, banks took the game away. They did. No, they, they, they put a they put a floor in things, and that's too bad. But at least there's other asset classes to trade, and it's not that there aren't opportunities in Currency. in those. It's, it, you, yeah. you just again, I'm going to go back to my regime thing. We're in a regime right now that if you have a strategy that use that, that that trades long optionality and FX, I'll go back to the top of top of the program. That's not a regime that I want to lever two or three x. That, that that's a strategy that I put at 0.25. Okay, what is it that you do? I buy options. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. I, I I buy options on on FX. You know, whatever swing trade setups. Okay, well, FX has been a wasteland. So given the regime, given the narrative, given what's happening. I would take, you know, out of 100 strategies, that one I would create like an implied netto number using a process and that netto number, and the netto number is how I maximize, or it's how I measure the implied return unit of risk, right? I say, okay, the higher your netto number, the better you as a manager, the better the market performs on a unit of risk basis. So then I create, I talk about this in, in chapter in chapter eight, about how I like use the netto number to, to, to effectively imply the profitability of the strategy. Now, that doesn't mean that's what it comes out to, of course. Like just having the process of saying, okay, using these metrics and using this, I can like measure the implied return punitive risk on this strategy and then adjust the gearing on that position accordingly. Okay. And you, you bring up oil. It's been a moonshot, uh, uh, really. And I think people were scarred, John, uh, seeing it go negative last year. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, sometimes, <laughs> yeah, but, but I mean, I've never thing, seen though. a commodity go negative. Yeah, so neither uh, have I, but, 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 but you got to come down to this though. And this is where I think you need to learn that people need to like um, bring with them like a greater degree of temporal granularity. And by temporal granularity, I mean that like, like you understand the time series that's involved in a crude contract. Okay. That, that, that what is true for the April contract or the May contract of 2020 right. is not true for the January contract of 2021. What happened on the negativity there obviously is it for that one month for the supply for that one month okay due to the supply chain shock and doing just a complete halt of the u.s economy obviously there was we, no we storage there, be, there was no storage anywhere i mean they're putting in parking lots you know what i mean barrels yeah. and just parking lots and, and everywhere else okay so you saw a one-off phenomenon that was simply reflective of of a lack of supply availability in that one month. Okay? Well, Icon saw that. I heard Icon bought yeah. a million barrels and said, well, we have room. We have some storage yeah. space. No, come At and a negative the, price, he bought it. I don't even know. I'm, I'm sure he, I'm sure he just. That's what I heard it. anyway. Yeah. You know, why, why, I mean, and, 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 and then you throw <laughs> in the, the disruption on the day of when that contract rolls off. I mean, I'm, I, uh, I got to see firsthand how that unfolded. And, and so, yeah, I mean, there you go. What do you think? Uh, I mean, do you do any kind of price projections or just a process? No, I think crude is at seventy five. Crude will be at seventy five by um, okay by the end of the year. Uh, yeah. You you want to leave us? Uh, you know, your best idea last time was beans. What's your best idea right now? And if you don't have one, that's okay too. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a basket of of like three of them. You know what I mean? And I think that we keep playing on this, and um, you know, so so it's February today. So if if I come back like at the end of the summer. You know, at the end of August, you're looking at S and P at 4,400, 4,350 on the S and P. You're looking at crude at 69.70 um, for the September contract. If I come back in August, you're looking at uh, I don't know soybeans at like if soybeans 20. are a little more idiosyncratic. I don't want to that soybeans is a different kind of a different trade, frankly. Um, I think the Russell is trading at 20, 2,500 ish. You're looking okay. at Nasdaq. 15,200. Okay. So, I mean, you see the broad theme going on here. Okay. Like this and is, why are you pointing towards August? You must have something in mind for that month. I, I'm, I'm picking six months from now, basically. Oh, That's okay. All. You're just, I'm okay. just picking six months. Yeah. Okay. And so six months from now, you're looking at, I think Bitcoin, is it like 75, 80,000? 75,000, yeah. six months. Yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah. Um, I see that you're designing something here. You're getting ready to open something <laughs> soon what, what what are you going to be doing here jen i um 
I uh, am uh, just just re- re- repurposing the website to make it more okay. um, interactive and, and whatever. And, and, and frankly, it's one of those. Uh, I'll be real with you. Like I make, I, I mean, I mean, I make my money trading now. Right. <laughs> and I need right. I need to get on this. It's had that thing there for like three months now, and like people are like. I can't buy the book internationally because I, I think yeah. you can buy it on Kindle, but like, I don't know, like, I think in the UK, even like I'm getting messages saying it's not there. I don't do a very good job of running my book selling business, to be honest with you. I'm kind of a trader. <laughs> yeah. I, I got to be more efficient. Yeah. That's, that's your do, passion. So. Yeah. All right. Well, um, John, you know, it was great, uh, you know, getting your views and perspectives on things and, you know, kind of tempers a few things I was thinking about and very interesting uh, point. Uh, my uh, Steve Olge was talking to me about this, what the central banks have done to the currency markets and uh, appreciate you, you know, I, I'll ask people, John, what's your most valuable currency? And people will say gold or euro or yen, and it's really our time. And so I want to thank you for spending your most valuable currency with us this morning. It's my pleasure. You do a great service for the trading community, Dale. Thank you so much. Uh, call me anytime. I, it's just a pure honor to be on here. Thank you uh, much, everyone. I really Best appreciate it, John. And uh, I'll get a hold of you. I'm thinking about May. So um, okay. I'll get a hold of you and we'll, we'll book something. Okay. Sounds good, sir. Be good. Be safe. Be healthy. Sir. All right. Thank good you. hunting. Everyone, John you, Netto. Sir. No longer an unknown market wizard, a known unknown market wizard. We'll see everyone tomorrow. Remember, don't just count your pips, count your blessings. Adios, everyone. And you could join the team uh, for the bias chart and technical talk in about half an hour, I believe, or 15 minutes. Right, Steve? Just a a little bit below 15 minutes, yes. Okay. And that's a wrap, everyone. We'll see everyone tomorrow. Wrap up the week.